Welcome back. Before we continue, allow me to greet our mothers who are watching and uh, listening today. Happy Mother's Day. So if you are beside your mom, give her a hug, give her a kiss and say Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mama. I love you, Mom. And uh, we praise God that we can have this special day today. You know, mothers are so special that, uh, and so dear to us that God has uh, used our mothers to reflect His image of care and compassion for her children. So before the day is over, let us take this opportunity to just honor, appreciate, show our love to our moms. And um, for us husbands, um, honor your wife, appreciate your wife uh, for, for being a mother of your children. And let's appreciate uh, our mothers and uh, encourage them and uh, appreciate them for their hard work, love, and sacrifice. Why don't we just bow our heads and pray for our moms? Lord God, thank you for the gift of mothers that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for their love, their sacrifice. We are here today because of our moms, that they have shaped our lives and they, they have taught us a lot of things. Thank you, Lord, for your compassion and care through them that we receive. I pray that you help them, Lord God, as they nurture, as they support their children, their husband, and uh, raise their family, O oh Lord. May you grant them your presence, bless them, O oh God, and help us always, Lord God, to give thanks uh, for our moms. May uh, you help us to obey them, to honor them, and in everything, may we glorify your name. Thank you, Jesus. This we pray in your name. Amen. Now let's listen to the Word of God. Since today is Mother's Day, our message for this morning is a mother's encounter with God. You know, in the Bible, there are many women and mothers who serve as great examples of faith. And these are the list of these women in the Bible. Now, if you were to select one female Bible character, who would that be? Probably you would choose um, those who are more popular, like uh, maybe Ruth or Esther. Why? Because most likely their stories are more colorful and dramatic. Yet how many of us would even choose and or even consider Hagar? Hagar the servant. Usually you only see Hagar as an attachment to the story of Abraham and Sarah, which is understandable because her account is quite short. But if we look closely, there's a beautiful lesson that we can learn from Hagar's story. In fact, among the female characters in the Old Testament, only Hagar had a special encounter with God two times. And so I invite you to learn with me today and let us look at Hagar's encounter with God. Please open your Bibles and follow along. We will be looking at two passages in Genesis 16, Genesis 21. Let's start. Hagar's first encounter with God, Genesis 16, verses 1 to 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord had prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. Hagar first appeared here in the story because it was said here that he was an Egyptian and a personal servant of Sarai. Most likely, she was part of the gifts that were um, given by Pharaoh to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Remember, during that time that Abram uh, went down to Egypt because of the famine in the land. And so uh, Abram and Sarai well, went down to Egypt. And therefore, he, Pharaoh, treated Abram well for her sake, uh, Sarah, and gave him sheep and oxen, donkeys, male, and female servants. Because during that time, Abram told, that, told Pharaoh that Sarai was, her, uh, was his uh, sister. And so Pharaoh fell in love with Sarah and uh, she gave, uh, Pharaoh gave gifts to Abram on the account of Sarah. But eventually, um, Pharaoh found out, and so they were casted out of Egypt, and then they returned back now to Canaan. Now, in her story, 
Abraham and Sarai were back at Canaan and had lived there for some time, about 10 years. But Sarai had remained childless. By the way, Abraham is the uh, old name of Abraham and Sarai was the old name of uh, Sarah. And so, in a desperate attempt of Sarai to solve her barrenness, Sarai proposed to Abraham to sleep with her servant girl, Hagar. Sarai knew about God's plan that eventually Abraham would have a child, but Sarai grew impatient and so she arranged her personal servant girl to sleep with her husband. Now, you have to understand the two important things about their culture during that time. First, in ancient culture, a woman's primary role is basically to bear children and build a family. And because of this, children be, uh, became the source of a woman's significance in her life. And without them, they, um, the women felt, uh, they felt worthless. And that is why for many women in the Bible who started out as barren, like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, it, it's something very painful for them and devastating to know that they're barren and that was also even shameful for them. Secondly, in their culture, uh, it was a common practice what Sarai did. Um, the female slaves were uh, used and somehow uh, made uh, to be concubines and even wives of their master in order to gain a child and an heir for the family. In this case, Sarai may not have a bi biological child but she can have a legitimate offspring through her servant, Hagar. And according to the custom, the child would become a legal, uh, would be considered a legal child of Abraham and Sarai. So what happened next? We are told that uh, Abraham listened to his wife and he agreed with the plan. And so Abraham went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she, Hagar, saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. To despise means to treat with contempt or dishonor or to make light or a small thing. You see, Sarai had become small in Hagar's eyes. When she became pregnant, Hagar became proud and thought of herself to be better and greater than Sarai. Unfortunately, she again she, she became proud and she despised her mistress. Perhaps things could have been better uh, or different if Hagar remained humble. Unfortunately, she looked down on her mistress, Sarai. And so how did Sarai respond to Hagar? Verse 5. And Sarai said to Abraham, May the wrong done to me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despite in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. See, Sarai here blamed her husband for failing to control Hagar's attitude. At the same time, Sarai accused Abraham that perhaps maybe because Abraham was also excited to become a father, he had neglected what is necessary uh, to remind Hagar of her appropriate place with the household. So in short, Sarai saying, Abraham um, spoiled Hagar. And so feeling guilty and wanting to appease his wife, Abraham said this, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly and she fled from her presence. Abram gave Sarai the freedom to act as she wished. His intention might be good, but somehow the bad situation became worse and more complicated. So Sarai was distressed and upset with her servant Hagar, and because of this, she got even and started treating her harshly. We do not really know how Hagar was mistreated. Some Bible scholars say that it was possible Sarai removed Hagar from the role of being a maid servant with all its benefit that comes with its position, and Hagar's standing was reduced to that of a female slave. In other words, Hagar got demoted and lost her job as Sarai's maidservant, and she became a slave, and because of that, she was also required to do hard labor. Now, before we continue on, let's think about Hagar's situation. She was an Egyptian, but she had to leave her homeland so now she's serving in a foreign country as a servant. Uh, also, she's um, a lonely woman. So a woman and as a foreigner during that time, she has no voice. She was alone with no family members to give her emotional support. Again, as a servant, she had no rights and treated as a property. 
As a slave, she had no choice but to follow her master or mistress wishes to become a surrogate mother whether she liked it or not. Hagar was unwanted and rejected. No one cared about her. And even when she became pregnant, no one cared about her child. She was mistreated and despised. Yes, she provoked her mistress, but to treat her harshly was still wrong. You see, Hagar was on her own. She was financially broke. She was a single mom, a pregnant mom, and there's no one to support her. It's a woman's worst nightmare. Now, if you were in Hagar's shoes, what would you do? I think most of us would also try to escape the difficulties and run away. Because of Hagar's distress due to Sarah's harsh treatment, she just fled suddenly without any preparation. She just left and ran away. And actually, it was a desperate move for a pregnant woman who, has nothing, who was nowhere to go and who was far away from her homeland. Now, let's continue with the story. Now, the angel of the Lord found Hagar by the spring in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to shore. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. You see, Hagar's flight from Sarai led her to the wilderness in the desert. She became tired from traveling and then she took a rest at the water spring on the road to shore. Sure was actually a road leading back to Egypt near its borders. But while resting there, what do you think Hagar's thoughts were? Negative thoughts? Fearful thoughts? Worrisome thoughts? And maybe hopeless thoughts? Maybe Hagar was asking, will my baby survive? Where will I go? Who will take care of me? What will happen tomorrow? But amazingly, it was here in the wilderness, at Hagar's lowest point in her life, when she encountered God. The passage tells us that the angel of God found her. Now, the angel of God here is God's messenger. But later on in the story, we would know that the angel was no ordinary angel. He was actually God himself. Some scholars say that when God himself is present physically in the Old Testament, it is the appearance of a pre-incarnate Christ. See, it is the form of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, the angel of God. Now, Hagar was not really looking for God by this time. She was just running away. She was tired and she was maybe thinking of what to do next. But it was God who came looking for Hagar. And when the angel have found her, he was gracious to her. First, the angel of the Lord called her, Hagar, Sarai's maid. Imagine Hagar's surprise. She had never met this person before, but it seemed that she, he knew her very well. The angel also asked Hagar two insightful questions. Where have you come from? Where are you going? Hagar answered the first question. She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my Mr. Sarai. Now let us reflect on this for a moment. Maybe your life is not exactly like Hagar, but like her, have you ever felt being pushed into a corner where you found yourself no choice that you are forced to do what other people want you to do? Have you been in a difficult and a messy situation? Yes, partly because it was your own doing. But again, you came to that desperate point that you feel so alone that there's no, no one to help you and not even support you. Have you experienced the torment of being filled with negative thoughts, helpless thoughts, hopeless thoughts? Or is there someone in your life that make that is making your life difficult right now or even unbearable for you? Do you feel like uh, that your life is getting worse and spinning out of control and you feel that you're heading nowhere? Maybe your life is like that of Hagar. Now, if you find yourself in this situation, most likely you would also choose to escape and run away from difficulties. Maybe some of you have already run away you find yourself in the wilderness, you're in that place of despair, you don't know where to go and what would happen next. But you see, in the midst of despair, God showed himself to Hagar. That, and he told her that he cares. And in the same way, God wants to show himself to us and tell us that he cares for you and me. But, and now back to our story. Without giving Hagar a second 
chance to answer the question, um, the angel of the Lord gave her this command. Then the angel of the Lord said, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her. God commanded Hagar, Go back and submit. Humble yourself. Embrace your problem. Face your difficulties. Now, if you were Hagar, for me, if I were Hagar, I would argue with the angel. Are you crazy? Why would I come back? Why do I go back? I'd rather die than submit to my mistress. It doesn't make sense. He, she's very hard on me. It doesn't make sense. Why would I go back? A good thing Hagar did not argue, but instead she kept listening to the angel of the Lord. Verse 10. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to come. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with a child. You will bear a son. We will call him Ishmael because the Lord has given him to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. He will lead to the east of all his brothers. You see, this, despite the seemingly illogical and unreasonable command of the angel of the Lord, Hagar obeyed. Why? Because of God's promise and God's assurance. First, because of God's promise. Verse 10, God said, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to come. Note that God gave this promise to Abram in the previous chapter, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 to 6. And he, God, took Abram outside and said, Now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then Abram believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now by his grace, God decided to extend this part of his promise to Abraham. God decided to extend this to Hagar as well. Hagar, being part of Abraham's household, also experienced the blessing of God's covenant. As the covenant that God made uh, to Abraham, which the scholars call the Abrahamic covenant. Covenant. This extension of the promise to Hagar shows us that God's grace and faithfulness to his promise. And fast forward 4,000 years, then after that, many uh, Arabs and Muslims now consider Ishmael, Abram's son, as their physical and spiritual father. And actually, according to the survey study in 2015, 24% of the world population today were Muslims. Now here's the point. See, God honors His word and He is faithful to His promises. God honors His word and He is faithful to His promises. So dear brothers and sisters, those of us who have put our faith in Christ are now also considered as children of Abraham. We belong to Abraham's household. Galatians 3 tells us, so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the, belie the believer. Because of this, God's promise of blessing to Abraham is also extended to us. And that is because of through Christ our Lord. Christ is also the son of Abraham. And this is our greatest blessing. Christ redeemed us in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles. So that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Dear brothers and sisters, if we are in Christ, we are heirs of Abraham. We are co-heirs with Christ. That means we are loved and we're blessed. That means God will not abandon us. God will not forsake us. And as God said to Abraham, his great desire and intention is not just to bless us, but also to bless the world through us. And so this is our security, that God will take care of us. Second, Hagar also obeyed God because of God's assurance. Verse 11, Behold, you are with a child, and you will bear a son, and you will call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. The angel of the Lord assured Hagar that her baby will survive. God was even the one who named her child. She was to call her son Ishmael. Now, why Ishmael? In Hebrew, the name Ishmael means God hears. God hears. So in the years to come, every time, whenever Hagar would call out the name of her child, Ishmael, she would remember God's grace in her life. 
You see, through Hagar's story, we learn that God comes to the aid of those who are afflicted. Like Hagar, God comes to not to us, uh, not just because not because we're we're praying well, we're living well, but God comes to us because He cares for you and me, especially when we are hurting. Our text says, the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Now, the passage did not say that Hagar prayed directly to God. But despite that, God heard Hagar's cry of anguish. And that was enough for God to act on her behalf. What a picture of a loving and a compassionate God. He is the Lord who hears. And He hears those who are crying in distress. Dear friends, like Hagar, some of us may be in a distressful situation right now. Or maybe you know someone who is in one. And as you go through your difficulties, perhaps you're tempted to run away, to be physically uh, away, to quit emotionally. But at the same time, um, you, you want to escape. Perhaps it could be a uh, difficult marriage, a rebellious child. Maybe an overwhelming responsibility. Perhaps it's a challenging situation in your work or in your business. But remember that you are not alone. The God who met Hagar in her most desperate moment is the same God who wants to meet you because he cares for you. And God wants to meet you right now where you are. And this gives us the assurance that it is he the Lord, He is the God who hears, and He hears those who are crying desperately. He hears our cries, He hears your questions, He hears your prayers. Now, there are times that running away might be the wisest thing to do, especially when your life is in danger. You may need to protect yourself or even your loved ones. But going through difficult trials is not always solved by escaping. At times, God calls us to go back and face our distressing circumstances. Sometimes going back and embracing the hard situation is the only way to experience God's blessing. Now, if Hagar chose not to obey, who knows what might have happened to her? She and her baby might have suffered um, severely and perhaps they have died. But because of God's great promise and assurance, Hagar found the courage and strength to obey. Even if it was scary, even if it was shameful, she went back and faced her problem. You see, like Hagar, maybe God is asking you to stop running away and just to surrender to Him. Maybe God is asking you to humble yourself, to embrace your trials, to endure your suffering. Yes, it may seem counterintuitive or even illogical, but if this is something that is God is asking you to do, then be confident that God is watching over you. And be confident that when you obey God, there will be a blessing. And you can find rest in Him, knowing that He will fulfill His good purpose and plans for your life, despite the difficulties that you will face. So as for Hagar, this is how she responded after she received God's promise and assurance. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. For she said, Have I remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore the well was called, called Be'er Lakhai Ro'i. Behold, it was between Kadesh, Kadesh and Bered. See, had, uh, Hagar recognized the angel of the Lord as God himself. She realized that she should have died because she encountered God face to face. And yet she didn't. So Hagar responded by honoring God and called on the name of the Lord. And this is what she declared. Verse 14, You are the God who sees me. You are el Roi. You are the God who sees me. Hagar realized and tells herself, Here is a God who sees me, who knows who I am, who was gracious to me. And out of her astonishment and gratitude for God's gracious attention towards her, she named this well where she met God. She named it Be'er Lakhai Ro'i. Be'er Lakhai Ro'i literally means the well of the living one who sees me. Now, the Bible tells us that this was located between Kadesh and Bered. It's interesting that Kadesh means sanctuary and Bered means hail or storm. So somewhere between the sanctuary and the storm, 
there's a calm between the calm and the chaos God and the Lord provided Hagar with a place of refreshing and rest. Now note this as well. Earlier, God revealed that Hagar uh, knew that he was, uh, he's the God who hears, but now Hagar had a more profound realization. God is not just the God who hears, but he is also the God who sees. And this is also what the writer of the Chronicles tells us, 2 Chronicles chapter 16. For the eyes of the Lord move toward, move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And this is an encouraging promise for us today as well. So whether you are in a severe difficulty or trial right now, I hope and pray that you will not give up, that you will not quit. Always remember that you are not alone. God sees you and God hears you. Through this first encounter with God, Hagar came to know the El Roi, the God who sees. He is the one who sees her past, her present, and future. And that is the same way with us today. God sees where we came from. God knows our past. God knows our present. And God definitely and surely he knows where we are going. He knows our future. And so, if we have to submit to our difficult circumstance, don't worry because God sees. If you are aching under the pain of discomfort and distress, do not worry because God sees you. And if you are trying to run away and trying to escape, God knows and God sees that. And as you become more aware and convinced of that you are under God's watchful eye and care, like Hagar, may you find the strength and the comfort knowing that with the Lord you can face your difficulties, knowing that God sees you can embrace your trials, you can endure your suffering. For Hagar, knowing that God hears and God sees her need is more than enough assurance for her to obey the Lord. So she willingly obeyed and returned to her mistress and she stayed with them for the next 17 years. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. And this is the lesson that God teaches us today through Hagar's story. Do not be afraid, for God hears, and he will help us. Fear not, for the Lord sees, and he will save us. Do not be afraid, for God hears, and he will help us. Fear not, for the Lord sees, and he will save us. The next, Hagar's second encounter with God. Hagar's second encounter with God happened around 17 years later. Then the Lord took note of Sarah, and as he said, the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid will not be an heir with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. After Isaac was born, God changed the names of Abraham and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. So we can see another tension erupted between Sarah and Hagar. What triggered it? Sarah saw Ishmael mocking her son. We all know that moms can be very protective of their child. But it's actually not just about the mocking that Sarah was angry about. The real issue here is about the future inheritance of Abraham's son. Legally, since Hagar's son Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abraham, he was entitled to receive the double portion of the inheritance. Sarah knew about this, so she made a decisive action. She made another proposal and tried to convince her husband to drive out Hagar and Ishmael. But Abraham was greatly distressed about this. Of course, he loved Ishmael as well. Also, the first time Abraham listened to his wife about Hagar, what happened? Of course, trouble happened. But this time, Abraham was probably thinking twice if listening to his wife was the right thing to do. Something amazing happened. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. 
whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac your descendants shall be named, and of the son of the maid I will make a nation also, because he is your descendant. Did you see that? See, husbands, there are times that we need also to listen to our wives because sometimes it's the right thing to do. You see, God himself gave Abraham this confirmation. He told Abraham, this time it's okay to listen to his wife. It was the Lord who told Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away. Why? Because it is through Isaac that the Lord will fulfill the covenant promise and it will continue through his line because this was God's original plan. But at the same time, God promised Hagar as he also promised Abraham that God will make Ishmael into a great nation as well. And both of these promises will happen because of God's goodness and faithfulness to Abraham. Verse 14, chapter 21. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. Notice what Hagar received. She was only given bread and one skin of water. And how many days will it last? Especially for her and Ishmael. Remember, during this time, Ishmael is already a teenager. Diba mga teenager, ang lakas kumain? How long will it last for, for this food and water uh, to, to last for their supply? And think about it. Abraham was a wealthy man. He could have certainly afforded to give them a camel or with loads of food and supplies. But he didn't do that. After all, Ishmael was Abraham's son, isn't it? But sadly... Hagar only got a meager provision for the journey. It's like receiving a death sentence. And actually, this is something that uh, she, what she can look forward to is only to die a slow and painful death in a desert. Again, imagine if you're Hagar. For the second time, you found yourself in the wilderness. This time, it was the, the wilderness of Beersheba. It's, it's a different wilderness from the previous one. This time she found herself in the wilderness again, but by force rather than by choice. Again, you found yourself in a situation that's beyond your control. And once more, you were driven away from safety and security. Even if you're afraid, you have no choice but to follow. You're a single mom with a teenage son to care for. You need, you have only a little, but you need a lot. You don't really know where to go, so you find yourself wondering about the wilderness. If you were Hagar, how would you feel? What would you do? Now, come to think about it, who told Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away? It was Sarah, right? But in verse 13, actually, it was God himself who confirmed this to Abraham. God said, send Hagar and Ishmael away because I have a plan for them. Now, compare this to experiences of Hagar. In her first encounter with God, Hagar ran away from the safety of Abraham's household, and she ended up in the desert. But God told her, go back. But here in the second encounter, Hagar was forced to leave from the safety of Abraham's house, and she again found herself in the desert. But this time, God told her, move forward. What's the lesson here? See, as we face the problems and difficulties, we need to discern what God is directing us to do. Is commanding, is he commanding you to go back? Or is God commanding you to move forward? And to know the answer, you need to seek the Lord in prayer. And also you need to seek uh, good and wise counsel so that you can benefit from God's leading as well. Now going back to Hagar's second encounter, here's another point. As we go through the desert experience, we might think that other people cause it to happen to us. Perhaps you think of because of your situation, it's, it's because of your boss, your loved ones, or the government, or someone that you trusted the most that betrayed you. While it may be true that others were responsible for your misery, they're not the ultimate cause of it. Similar to Hagar's experience, it was God who allows our suffering and pain. You see, many times God allows sinful men to have their sinful ways, and He allows them uh, because of their free will but sadly that also impacts us negatively but still God allows this not because he is unloving or he is not trustworthy but he permits our suffering because he has a bigger plan and a higher purpose in your life and mine now let's read on when the water of the skin was used up she left the boy under one of the bushes then she went and sat down opposite him 
about a bow shot away, for, his, for she said, Do not let me see the boy die. She sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. You see, this is a very heartbreaking scene. After wandering some time in the desert, Hagar's food supply and water finally ran out. Both Hagar and Ishmael were so tired, both of them were hungry and thirsty, and both of them were just waiting for the end. And after putting her son under the shade of the bush, she walked some distance away where she also sat down herself. No help in sight. Hagar just gave up hope and just waited for the in inevitable. Hagar knew that her son was dying. The parents expect for uh, her um, that she would die before her children, but to see a child die before you, it's uh, very heartbreaking. And this is the greatest sorrow of a mother to witness. Now, in the same way, Hagar couldn't bear the thought of seeing her child die. So she did the only thing that a loving mother could do in this situation. And that is she cried and wept. And in helplessness, Hagar cried out her voice and he poured her heart out. Now tell me, do you sympathize with Hagar and Ishmael? Well, maybe, perhaps not really. Maybe because we see them as someone who to be people who are outside of the faith. Maybe we can consider them that even the, as the enemies of the faith. But you see, God is not like us, and his attitude towards Hagar and Ishmael was very different from that of Sarah's attitude. Yes, God did approve for them to be sent out, but God does not share Sarah's cruel motivation. God's heart is sensitive to those who are suffering. In fact, the psalmist tells us that God has a special heart for those who are afflicted. You, O Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them, and you listen to their cries. God listened to the cry of the afflicted. Now let's look at what happened next. Hagar wept and waited for what she thought was inevitable. But the Lord intervened, and God heard her cry, heard the lad cry, and the angel of God called Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear. For God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. You see, the angel of God called out to Hagar from heaven. Now look at how God was described here and notice what God said. Verse 17, God had heard the lad crying. And the next, do not fear for God has heard the voice of the lad. Again, the text did not say, again, the text did say that both Hagar and Ishmael wept. But it did not explicitly say that both cried out to God. In this passage, it only said they cried. Nonetheless, God showed himself in love and mercy. Whether they cried directly to him or not, God still heard Hagar and Ishmael. And this is the higher purpose that God had in mind. And that is why he allowed Hagar and Ishmael to go through the suffering, even to have a near-death experience. Because you see, God wanted to reveal himself again to Hagar and to also that to Ishmael, that he is the God who hears. Like a compassionate mother who responds to her child in anguish, the Lord in his mercy responded to Hagar and Ishmael's affliction. And this passage tells us twice that God heard. God heard. God heard their cries. And this is the message of God to us as well. God hears. If you remember, there was the same passage that God gave Hagar when he encountered years ago when she ran away from the desert. God even commanded Hagar to name her son Ishmael, which means, which means God hears, so that she won't forget. And now in the midst of her new distress, she had forgotten God's promise. So the Lord had to remind Hagar again that he is the God who hears. Now, this is the same thing that God desires for us today, to you and me. God wants to reveal that each of, to each of us that He is the God who hears us, especially when we are crying in pain. Some of us here may have already learned this in the past, but because we are again in another set of trial and suffering, maybe we have forgotten that God has heard us before and God is continuously hearing us. And as we go through our desert experience, maybe we see our hopes and dreams die one by one. And perhaps again, we maybe we have forgotten who is the Lord. And therefore, God is using this opportunity right now, in this time of trying, in these near-death experiences that we are going through, 
that He is the God who hears us. And this is the assurance that we have. And so as God tells Hagar then, so God tells us today, do not fear. Do not fear. Now the command do not fear is one of the most frequently repeated statements in the Bible. Actually, it was uh, mentioned more than 300 times. Some even say that this command was repeated 365 or 366 times in the Bible. Actually, it's one command of do not fear for every day of the year. And what an encouragement. And even our Lord Jesus also taught this to his disciples. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than sparrows. Again, what's the reason for God's command to not fear? Do not fear because God hears. Do not fear because God hears. Friends, this is our encouragement. So what are you afraid of right now? What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? God tells us that we do not fear because God hears us in our distress. And the Lord Jesus reminds us that we are more valuable than sparrows. Our good Father in heaven sees us and hears us. And because God hears us, we can then be confident that God will help us. And therefore, let us not forget this lesson. Do not be afraid for God hears and he will help us. Fear not, for the Lord sees, and he will save us. This is what God told Hagar afterwards. Verse 18 to 19. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him by the hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. After God encouraged Hagar that he is the God who hears, the Lord reconfirmed his initial promise back then in verse 10 that Hagar will have a numerous descendants through Ishmael and he will become a great nation. Then God opened Hagar's eyes and showed her the well and both of them survived. Now think about it. God saved Ishmael and Hagar just at the right time. God's help did not come too early nor too late. God's rescue came in just at the right moment because his timing is always perfect. And this is the same way that God deals with each of us today. He intervenes and He rescues us just at the right time. See, I'm sure you have also experienced last-minute intervention and perfect timing rescue by God. You've been saved by God in unexpected and even miraculous ways. And you've even experienced it many times. Personally, I also experienced this in my life. When I face a problems, there are times that God would allow me or to let me have my own way first. He will allow me to exhaust all my plans and all my options until I get to the end of my rope. And then when I got to that point of desperation, to that point of surrender, that's the only time that when God will show up to save me and He will show me and provide me a way out. And why does He do that? So that in the end, I will not say, I am good, I am so wise, but in the end, all that God wanted me to do is to acknowledge Him and praise Him and worship Him. In the end, all He wanted me to say is, Thank you, Lord. You're so good. Thank you, God. You're so wise. It is not me, but it is all you. Thank you, God, for rescuing me. See, this is what God desires for us. That we know Him truly. That He is the God who hears, the God who saves, the God who rescues, the God who cares. Now going back to our story, after God saved Hagar and Ishmael, he led them to safety and prospered them. Verse 20 to 21. God was with the lad, and he grew, and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Now think about this. The wilderness is a place of danger, death, and despair. But God is a faithful and loving God. And because of that, the, the desert became a safe place for Hagar and Ishmael. And it is a place where they found life and hope. The wilderness became a home to Hagar's family because God was with them. By God's guidance and protection, Ishmael grew strong and fulfilled God's purpose in his life. His mother took a wife from him and from him then came 12 tribes as recorded in Genesis chapter 25. 
And these are the sons of Ishmael. These are the names by their village, by their camps. Twelve princes according to their tribes. You see, God in his goodness blessed Ishmael. The Ishmaelites settled in the wilderness of Paran, which is the place what we now know right now as Arabia. You see, God does not only care for his chosen people. He also cares for all the tribes and nations. God shows his love and compassion even for those who don't feel that they are chosen, even those who feel they're rejected, those who are looked down upon. So dear church, if God did not abandon Hagar and Ishmael, their trying times and their desperate moment, God will not abandon us as well. And how much more will he rescue us? How much more will he reach out to us because we are part of his chosen people? And our God is faithful, and He will fulfill His good plans for you and me, especially we are part of His covenant people, as His church today. Now, just as the Lord had been with Hagar and Ishmael, He also wants to be with you, especially in your times of difficulties. And if God is with you in your times of distress, then you can find peace and hope, despite being in the midst of despair despite being in a place of death the desert that you're going through right now can become a safe place for you where you can experience life and hope and therefore let us call unto God and cry out to him for it is he who sees us and he cares and he will save us and rescue us and therefore let us not forget our lesson for today do not be afraid for God hears and he will help us fear not for the Lord sees and he will save us Today we have learned about Hagar's story. Through her encounters with God, her life was fully transformed. Just think about it. Her life was turned around because of God's faithfulness in her life, because of how God met her. Before she was a woman and a foreigner with no voice, but God heard her cries. Before she was a slave, but now she's a freed woman in the desert. Her place of death became a place of life before she was alone but she was then given a son and out of her son became many descendants and a nation before she was unwanted and rejected but now she is favored and accepted before she was mistreated and despised but now she's protected and blessed by God because of God's faithfulness God turned around Hagar's hey, situation your church you and me are like Hagar as well we are we have been rejected in a love and wanted, but God desires to hear us, to help us. The question is, will we draw near to Him? Will we respond to Him? Will you obey Him? This is the challenge for all of us. May we not forget the lesson of Hagar's story. Do not be afraid, for God hears, and He will help us. Fear not, for the Lord sees, and He will save us. Do not fear, for God hears and He will help us. Fear not, for the Lord sees and He will save us. Let us pray. Oh Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Through the life of Hagar, we have learned that you are the God who sees, that you are the God who hears. Thank you, Lord, that despite Hagar being a woman, being a foreigner, a rejected, abused, unwanted, unfavored, O oh God, you have turned around her situation. We thank you that through her life, we were able to know you, that you are the God who sees, that you are the God who hears. And as we go through life in the midst of our difficulties, Lord, help us to know if you are calling us, Lord God, to go back to our situation, to embrace our trials, to endure our suffering, or maybe give us a wisdom to know and to discern when is the time to move forward. Help us, O oh God, Enable us, Lord, to hear from you. Thank you, Lord, for assuring us that you are with us, that will never leave us nor forsake us. And for today, we especially pray for our mothers. Thank you so much for their lives, for their love, Lord God, for the faith they model to us, for their sacrifice. Oh, Lord, especially, Lord God, for those who are going through pain and suffering right now, especially the single mothers, Lord God. May you be a husband to them, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you enable them, Lord God, to experience your blessing, your goodness, your faithfulness, your protection, your covering. 
Watch over them, O God. Provide for their needs. Help them, Lord God, to encounter you. May they know you, Lord God, the real God who sees and hears them at this time in their lives, Lord God, in their most desperate moments, in their darkest time, Lord God. May you enable them, Lord God, to hear you, encounter them, O Lord, and turn around their situation. Thank you, Lord, for the life of faith. Help us, Lord God, to walk by faith and not by sight. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that we who are in Christ are part of the covenant that you've allowed Abraham and even Hagar to experience, that through Christ, we are recipients of your blessing, of your inheritance, and may you find us faithful, Lord. Lord. Thank you for today. We love you, Lord, and may you alone be honored in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. This we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you again very much for joining us. God bless you and have a blessed Sunday and a week ahead.